Good morning. This is a History 1301 video about the coming of the American Revolution. The American Revolution was a confluence, as you may remember, of about three major components, one of which was religious activity and dissidence that goes, uh, dissidence and confusion uh, that goes back to the earliest foundings of the colonies. And that by the time you get to 1775, there had been uh, quite a bit of uh, of agitation and perhaps uh, also some understanding that there were England, England maybe be trying to establish Anglican Episcopy uh, in the colonies. Additionally, you're also going to see the rise and the inculcation of Whig political thought. Uh, that idea that uh, all men are not only created equal, as Jefferson might say in his uh, Declaration of Independence, uh, but that men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, such as life, liberty, and property, and that men in a state of nature came together and formed a government, uh, inverting that uh, the old tried and true method of from top down, from God to, to king to the, uh, to the common, uh, in fact, God king, aristocrat to common. So anyways, that has been upverted. And that's very much an English idea. You did not see that sort of idea taking really a great hold in France until later. You certainly didn't see it in places like Russia and Germany. Uh, but it is an English uh, idea of this uh, divine right of a man as the uh, as it is endowed with inalienable and natural rights. And that when liberty uh, was uh, in view, liberty needed to be protected by virtue and therefore the inculcation of virtues and being taught to the people. Only then and there could a republic and the people be certain in their rights and liberties and so forth. But the third and also equally important facet that's working in the Amer coming of the American Revolution uh, is that issue of self-governance, habits of self-governance. Some of it is found in the church house, which we talked about before, uh, particularly, say, with the Great Awakening, the, the building of new churches, and more especially uh, the idea that I decide, I choose uh, my own habit of self-governance with regard to my religious faith. But beyond that, uh, say, just in governing a church, say, the Congregationalist or a small, a small splinter sect like the Baptist, the Presbyterians to a large degree, the Quakers too, they all made their own choices, they all governed their churches and their uh, associations and their denominations accordingly. So there is that aspect to uh, to mention. But far beyond just the church house, you also have uh, just the fact that you have things like the Virginia House of Burgess or these assemblies in various colonies, practices and habits that are done and uh, that are done on a local level, sometimes legal, sometimes illegal, sometimes extra legal and all done particularly prior to 1700 without the blessing of the crown in London. And even after 1700, uh, there was kind of this out of sight and uh, look away sort of uh, mentality by the uh, British crown. So they uh, made those decisions. The colonists did. They're going to set themselves up. They're going to have their ways, and they're going to help. Uh, that's going to help uh, develop this long, long habit of self-governance in the American colonies. Uh, so with all these things coming together make a wonderful confluence of a river. Uh, oh, one other thing I almost forgot, too. Uh, if you look around in the Carolinas, you'll also find issues of law and order. And uh, just uh, in this idea of law and order, uh, the lack of law and order in the Carolina colonies uh, would also erode the authority of the crown. You can't protect us. We protect ourselves. How dare you try to assert your control over us? So all those things coming together uh, make for a powerful influence upon the American colonists and their friends in, in London and England. They're Whig friends in London and England. And so that set us up. And when we stopped last time, we were discussing uh, the coming of the American Revolution. We'd gotten to the Stamp Act, which was a tax, an internal tax upon various paper products and other official documents that would be used by many, many Americans. The fact that you had an internal tax and the tax was levied against the American uh, colonials without uh, proper representation in the, go in the Congress or excuse me, in the Parliament, that would be a large affront to the uh, nobility and the sensibilities of many of these Americans. The English, on the other hand, could not understand what we were upset about. It, uh, it made no sense to them that we as colonials, who were uh, the descendants of reprobates and scum and, and all those other pejoratives I've thrown around in class with regard to the Puritans and the Quakers and the Cavaliers and the Borderlanders, uh, they would not have understood why we would expect to have any sort of rights. And, and it also did affect and bother some of these Brits of this time period, these Englishmen of the time period, 
demonstrated that these Americans in the 1700s and especially the later 1700s as we come toward the revolution think of themselves as good good Amer Englishmen and they think of themselves as proper Englishmen not uh, any less than uh, their uh, uh, natural born native born uh, parents as it were those who live in London but the uh, Stamp Act was certainly really one of the great flashpoints, one of the first great flashpoints in the coming of the American Revolution. You had the Proclamation Line of 1763. You've had the end of the French and Indian War, which removed the French threat and helped open the way to the American Revolution uh, because you weren't driven to be together by that French threat in, uh, in the Mississippi River Valley or in Canada, for that matter. But in the Stamp Act, as we discussed in class, uh, there was a great deal of opposition from groups like Sam Adams and his Sons of Liberty, a uh, rather interesting motley crew of young men, some older, but all kind of rough and rowdy, uh, rough and tumble sorts. Uh, they weren't going to lay over, no thank you, uh, sir. Uh, but in addition to that, you're also going to see uh, not just Patrick Henry with his great declaration there in the House of Burgess, which as I may mention, Thomas Jefferson caught and many others saw, and brings Henry to the forefront in American history as one of the great orators of the English language, one of the great political polemicist or orators that we've ever had. Uh, but the fact of the matter was is that with the Stamp Act, you're also going to see a lot of debate in Parliament over this issue. And, uh, and Francis Townshend who was Chancellor of the Exchequer in uh, England. When I say Chancellor of the Exchequer, what that basically means, he is a man uh, who is like our Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, that Secretary of the Treasury, uh, who is uh, more or less uh, in control of the checking account, uh, he knows what they, uh, the money, the need. The British had spent a ton of treasure trying to protect and secure the American colonies. Well, with all that said, uh, old Francis uh, Townsend is going to stand up in the, in the Parliament there in London, and he's going to offer his full-throated defense of the Stamp Act and how it is a righteous and more especially a, a, a right uh, body of, uh, of legislation. So this is what old uh, Townsend said. So if I look away, I'm just reading and quoting. Quote, and, uh, and now will these Americans, children planted by our care, nourished by our indulgence until they are grown to a degree of strength and opulence and protected by our arms, will they grudge to contribute their might? And that might is not M-I-G-T-G-H-T, it is M-I-T-E, a might like a penny or a farthing, a very small amount of money. Will they can grudge to contribute their might to relieve us from the heavy weight of the burden under which we lie? And the man sitting in the room listening, one of the other members of Parliament sitting in the room listening to this is a fellow named Isaac Barre, or Barry, but all of really Barre, a B I A R R E with the accent over the E. He's a former British officer. He's a Whig. He had been in the Americas. He was fond of the Americans. He had sympathy for us. And this is what he replied back to uh, Townsend. And uh, they planted by your care? No, no, not a bit. They fled from your tyranny, then to a uncultivated and inhospitable or unhospitable country. They nourished by your indulgence? No, they grew by your neglect of them. They protected by your arms? They have nobly taken up arms in your defense. You see there between the Tories, which would be, say, Townshend's uh, allegiance politically and the Whigs, is this real great divide in British politics and, by extension, in a sense, the American system of what's, uh, what do you view the government? What role did the government, particularly Parliament, play? What did the Crown do for those uh, colonists in that uh, time period? Well, anyways, before it's all said and done, there's going to be a falling back and a step back and a uh, retreating back uh, from the Stamp Act. And uh, it is one of many steps along the route. Uh, in addition to that, you're going to also have what you might call the Townshend Duty Act. The Townshend Duty Act in 1767 is going to be the next step of taxation along the route. Uh, glass, paint, lead, various and sundry products that are used by uh, Americans on a regular basis would be just another one of those internal taxes that irritates Americans to no end. 
And so that Townshend Duty Act is there. There are protests and grumblings about it. It is a, another one of those flashpoints, one of those mile posts or mile markers if you're on an interstate on the road to the American Revolution. I use that expression regularly because when you look back at history and you can look back and you say, okay, uh, what was it that uh, brought on the American Revolution? What was it that brought on the Civil War? You have these mileposts and they are just as if you're traveling down a road. Okay, this happened, this happened, and this happened. And at the time, perhaps you may not have realized what was coming. Perhaps you did. Some will, some won't. Some will deny it. Some will clearly prophesy it, as, as you might say. But those mileposts are happening, and uh, the Townshend Duty Act, it was a uh, also a, a contentious issue. Uh, by the way, it will be repealed, and it will be left on the books, however. The Townshend Duty Act is also going to leave on the books a tax on tea. And if you know anything about the American Revolution, there is some issues with taxes on tea. Uh, so, anyways, again... We are being taxed, our liberty is being destroyed, our property is being taken away with us without our consent. Uh, those are those Whig issues, those very deep uh, uh, and strong issues that are working in the background all the same. And then actually, if you would, uh, you would go next to say the year 1770. 1770 is one of those flashpoint years in our history again. In March of 1770, you have a, a, the ending or toward the end of a cold winter. In fact, March of 1770 is about this time right now, about March 3rd, as I recall, March 5th, somewhere in that neighborhood, but early March nonetheless. Uh, 1770 was uh, the winter of 1769 and 70 was a cold winter in Boston in the environment of New England. Uh, I haven't really made a big deal about it, just sometimes I say it more often than others this semester. If I haven't, here it is. Just remember this is that you're in the middle still of what's called the Little Ice Age. From effectively 1350 to about 1850, you have a 500-year window in which the the uh, the Earth's surface cools demonstrably, and you're going to see phenomena and frozen lakes and rivers where they hadn't been frozen and recorded frozen before, or frankly since. Uh, it's part of the reason why you have some of the great vineyards moved down to France is because the vineyards of England had died; they'd been frozen, and so some of their uh, some of the wines uh, wineries uh, were taken down to France. So it was cold and uh, cold, and it is a I won't say it's an economic depression in 1770, but you've got a lot of young men in Boston in the er, the late winter of 1770 who are out of work and don't and have a lot of time on their hands. Some of them are American uh, Americans, and some of them are British soldiers. Kind of the practice of the British soldier in this time period was that uh, a British uh, soldier would perhaps drill in the morning, and uh, he would uh, perform his uh, soldierly duties in the morning. So that could depend on this what the uh, commanding officer was up to, uh, but uh, or what the uh, assignments were, but. Uh, he did not make enough money to live comfortably on. He had to find suitable employment elsewhere. A lot of Bostonians in 1770 did not appreciate the fact that there were troops being quartered in the American uh, cities and being quartered in Boston particularly. Uh, some of it goes back to those flashpoints with taxes, others because the troops sometimes had a reputation for being drunken, disorderly, uh, perhaps a bit rough and rowdy. Uh, they're, they're not always the most model of citizens. And so if you remember your, uh, your Constitution, one of the complaints that's going to be in there, especially in the uh, Third Amendment of the Constitution, has to do with quartering of troops. Now that really comes a little later with the quartering of troops in people's homes, but the reality is, is this idea of you cannot uh, take away my liberty, you cannot abuse my rights, you cannot abuse my privileges, that very strong Whig idea. So anyways, you've got that set right there. And uh, some of these soldiers will uh, come and knock on doors and ask, uh, perhaps in uniform, probably in uniform, uh, do you, and they would ask these British, uh, excuse me, these American colonials uh, in Boston, do you have any work for me? And the answer would be sometimes no, sometimes hell no. And then sometimes it would be so uh, blunt and uh, vile that it would be the equivalent of saying, yeah, sure, uh, I've got work for you. Come out here and clean my, uh, my commode. At, that's, and that's their way of saying, get off my land and get away. Uh, I'll treat you like uh, perhaps the prodigal son in that uh, biblical uh, parable by Jesus. Uh, because the prodigal son was a Jew, uh, he was also cleaning out the, uh, the uh, pigsty, and that's uh, a foul thing for an observant Jew. 
But anyways, long and the short of it is, is that it was a it was a harsh uh, reality. Uh, there a lot of discontent in Boston between the British soldier and the American uh, colonial. Throw into the mix, you also have some Sons of Liberty who then themselves uh, don't always make the best of uh, soldiers. Uh, excuse me, not soldiers, but the best of uh, citizens. Uh, and throw in the fact that some of them were young and they were out of work and they needed work. And well, what do young men do sometimes when they're bored? Well, like students have for years and years, or young men have done probably since uh, the days of the, the first time you fermented uh, wine or, or some sort of intoxicant, uh, a boring afternoon leads to drunkenness. And so in March of 1770, some drunken men, uh, drunken young men who were out of work, they were cold, they were, they were warming up by the alcohol. They started pelting and assaulting some British soldiers. These soldiers are not trained for crowd control. They're not trained for riot control. And they fire into this uh, crowd, this unruly mob of uh, British soldiers, and it is called the Boston Massacre. When it's all said and done, when you hear the word massacre, you think of, say, 15, 20, 30, 100 men killed, 100, uh, 100 children killed, 100 women uh, and men and children killed, whatever. You think of a lot of numbers. But the Boston Massacre was only five men killed. But, and also on top of that, you had about eight wounded. It was not a high number. But rather, rather than just sit there and say, well, that's not a massacre, uh, but in the eyes of Bostonians, it was, and more especially in the rabble-rousers who are out there trying to fan the flames of discontent, say the Sons of Liberty types, uh, and others who may not be quite Sons of Liberty, they thought it was absolutely outrageous that the British soldiery would exactly fire on good English citizens and subjects in Boston. It, 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 there was a lot of sympathy uh, in many circles in, in and around Boston for uh, those uh, who were killed. So maybe we might not, by our enlightened standards, call it uh, um, a, a massacre, but by their standards they did, and that's fine by me. They call it what they want to. That's what it's known to us as historically as the Boston Massacre. And so it was a, it was a real cause celebre. The thing is, is that uh, one of the men who's going to come to the forefront next in this Boston Massacre time period, the uh, first time we really introduce his name into the equation. We've had Thomas Jefferson mentioned a little bit. We've had Washington with his uh, love affair with a bullet. Uh, in addition to Ben Franklin, you know, those great heavies and worthies of the American Revolution. Here's your next name that you probably ought to make note of, a fellow named John Adams. The Adams family, their numbers and their names are going to dot American history for the next 125 years or so. You see the Adams is active in the revolutionary period with Sam and his cousin John. Uh, then of course you see John Quincy who's a son and then you get Charles Francis and Henry Adams and on down the list there's, a, there's seemingly an Adams in American history from this time period now, 1765, 70, etc. all the way to like 1910 or so when they start to die off and kind of lose their, their potency. But the Adams family is a big and important individual and John, uh, important family in our early to, uh, frankly, most of our history. And on top of that, John Adams is a founding father. He's one of the great agitators of the revolution, and this is probably one of the greatest contributions he makes. One of the things you'll hear me say about uh, these men of, uh, of renown, men of American history, is, is that not everyone who does great things is going to, uh, be, is going to do it as president. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of men who occupy the presidency, and their greatest contribution to history was not in the presidency. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Uh, but uh, say for Ulysses S. Grant, Civil War fame, it was being a general and saving the Union and freeing the slaves. That's that's his greatest uh, contribution. Uh, arguably, for and no, not arguably, I would argue, say it's just pretty much a, a understood fact that the greatest contribution of James Madison was being father of the Constitution, being that great thinker and intellectual, and helping guide the formation of that wonderful document that governs our country to this day. James Madison was not a bad president, but he was not a good one either. And then on down the list we can go. Uh, but uh, John Adams, president, he makes a mediocre president, in my opinion. Uh, he's not great, uh, but at the same time, John Adams' contributions, particularly with regard to diplomacy, uh, he was a decent diplomat, and he was a great founding father, a great agitator, a great revolutionary. 
uh, with his uh, hidebound ways, his uh, intellect, his ability, he really pushes and pushes and pushes, and he helps bring it on. Uh, John Adams himself actually is uh, is kind of a little shorter than average for his era. He's not uh, radically so. He's about 5'6". Average height of this time period, say 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, so he's a little shorter than average, but nothing unusual. Uh, short by our uh, standards. Uh, he was, uh, as he got older, a little bit plump. In fact, actually later on in life he will be referred to by his uh, friends and mostly especially his political enemies. They'll refer to him as his uh, rotundancy, uh, his rotundancy, that big, uh, uh, big man. He did not miss a meal. He also loved to, uh, he also loved to eat. Right aside from loving to eat, he also uh, loved to drink. Uh, he was not a drunk. He was not an alcoholic or anything of that nature, but his eye opener every morning was hard cider. So, uh, and he lived to be 90 years old in an era when men didn't live to be 90, he did. So maybe that had something to do with the fact that he lived as long as he did uh, with he drank hard cider as his opener, eye opener every morning. A good belt of hard cider to get you going. So anyways, uh, a, a character in that sense. But more especially, anybody who met him never was without opinion of John Adams. John Adams was, perhaps in an overworked phrase on my part, he was a bit of an exposed nerve ending. Uh, he was a harsh man at times. He was grumbling. He was a perfectionist, self-righteous. Oh my gosh, all those Adamses have self-righteous streaks in them a mile wide. Uh, he believed that he was persecuted. He was uh, believed that he was an, had an uh, people no one uh, appreciated him. In fact, uh, there is a quote uh, attributed to him, probably true, uh, and if it's not, it could have been said by him. It goes basically like this: that he was complaining one day during the revolution uh, to. Ben Franklin. Uh, they were in France together as diplomats, and he basically said, uh, no one's going to remember me, Franklin. No one's going to remember me. It's just going to be you and George Washington, and uh, and you're going to take your electric rod, they'll say, struck the ground and up George, jumped George Washington on a horse, and it was Franklin the horse in Washington that won the uh, revolution. And it was, I'll never be remembered. And then that's not true, of course. I'm sitting here talking about him 200 plus years after the fact. But reality is, is that he, Frank, he Adams, believed that no one uh, would uh, appreciate him. And he, he'd carry that on. And he carried grudges. Oh my gosh, you'll read about him later in life uh, looking around. And uh, he'll be actually uh, shoveling manure on his farm in Braintree, Massachusetts. And he'll be shoveling manure or shoveling hay or doing work. And you'll hear him just muttering under his voice about some event in the past, political, uh, somebody wronged him, Alexander Hamilton, Jefferson. And by the way, Jefferson and Adams in their revolutionary period are great friends. And then they become political enemies, bitter political enemies, and then later in life they become great political friends again. I mean, just simply friends. And they exchange a mountain of letters, which is really one of the great uh, historical treasure troves of American history. Anyways, but Adams' uh, ballast, as he called it, was a woman, and it was his wife, Abigail. Now, I'll mention to you, and have always mentioned to you, and have never shied away from telling you the men who were the real womanizers and the real... Uh, uh, zeros and adulterers who were out there, and then there were also the men who were honest and true, uh, and true to their wives, and frankly, uh, at least in that sort of sense, was a very moral and upright man, and in the case of John Adams, that would be his relationship with Abigail. It was at times stormy, and I don't mean that in a horribly bad way, but they didn't always just uh, say good morning and then kissy face and all that business. But John Adams and his wife Abel, uh, Abel uh, Abigail, they will, uh, they will argue, they will debate, they will fight, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but they argued and sometimes very vigorously. She was an independent-minded woman, very educated in her own right. She was one of the few women who probably could have handled John Adams, and she, John Adams might have been one of the few men that could have handled her. They made a good pair, even if times it was more like oil and water. But they made a very good pair together, and they worked together particularly well. He would pick on her, for an example, uh, from time to time and say, essentially, honey, you're getting fat. Don't you think you need to start working out a little bit? Now, obviously, he, they didn't have Gold's Gym or Planet Fitness or CrossFit or anything like that to go throw around some tires. But he would make some of those snide remarks to her, and she'd fire right back and give as good as she got and basically remind him of his, uh, his lack of, uh, of uh, 
well, basically his fatness. And so anyways, they made a wonderful relate, had a wonderful pair. They had a good number of children together. And so many of them who will, at least uh, Quincy Adams will go on to be a, some sort of some fame. He's going to, Quincy Adams is going to be a prominent man in the second generation of America. But anyways, uh, John Adams is certainly one of our founding fathers. And the fact is, is that this is in a 1770, that Boston Massacre is where Adams comes back into our forefront, into our knowledge once more. Adams in 1770 is not a revolutionary. He's not. In fact, in 1770, he has a low opinion of revolutionaries. He has a low opinion of the Sons of Liberty. In fact, actually, I think the HBO docudrama from a few years ago does a decent, if not a first-rate job of explaining Adams' uh, uh, kind of uh, antipathy toward the Jack, uh, the Jack Tars, as he called them, that were in that mob that attacked the troops. In fact, actually, this is what he uh, referred to those troops as. He said, it was a motley rabble of saucy boys, Negroes and mulattoes, Irish teagues and jack tars. That was uh, Adams's phrase. I'm quoting him directly. The fact of the matter is, is that Adams uh, did not have much use for those uh, Sons of Liberty. And so when the Crown or the representatives of the Crown there in Boston, the royal authorities, uh, asked him to defend the soldiers, he did. And it cost him. It cost him goodly amounts of money. It cost him business because one of the things that I've said before to you, the three great scourges of mankind, the doctors, the lawyers, and the preachers, uh, the era of the lawyer is really opening. If you're a nation of laws and a nation of rules and a nation of regulations, you're going to need lawyers to write documents and to do various and sundry legal acts. You, most men can't do it by themselves. That's why lawyers are trained in the law. Adams was a really good lawyer. He had a legal mind to him. And he was, but the most important thing about Adams was he had, uh, it was good and bad. It, it served him well and it hurt him at other times. Is is that Adams has a, a rod of iron in his back. That man is not afraid to stand up in the most proper use of the word, to stand up and fight for what he believed to be right. And I'm not talking about that cheap throwaway line that every politician seems to uh, uh, parrot out nowadays. I'm going to stand up for you, and I'm going to fight for you, and occasionally I'll stand up and fight for you at the same time. But no, for Adams, he actually meant it, and he actually did it. And so for him, the Boston Massacre defending the, the British soldiers cost him money, cost him position, cost him friends even. But this is the important concept, though. When John Adams comes back in 1773, more especially 1774, and starts to turn into a revolutionary and say, we need to break away. We need to challenge authority. We need to assert our rights as good Englishmen endowed by their creator. The fact of the matter was when he came around and said that, a lot of folks would look at Adams and say, you know, that man was a man who, who defended the British soldiers when it would cost him. He's a man of principle and integrity. The fact that he's now saying this and he's changed his mind because of what has happened, we need to listen to him. Perhaps some of you may be saying that would be why I wouldn't listen to him. He's not a great man because he didn't understand it right away. Um, I do happen to agree with uh, others who have said, uh, say, Bowles uh, comes to mind in that lecture from a few weeks back. Uh, but basically, the idea is, is that from time to time, it's not unreasonable to change your mind about somebody or something because circumstances change. Your life changes, their life changes, on we can go and go and go. So anyways, Adams changes his mind later on, and it helps him. Whereas his cousin Sam Adams, the great revolutionary and rabble-rouser to begin with, Sam Adams was uh, kind of first on the scene. He was first to understand. So, you know, which Adams you prefer is your business. But uh, John Adams is going to be one of the early supporters of the, excuse me, one of the uh, supporters of the revolution. And he is a, the, a perfect revolutionary for the English-American experience. So the Boston Massacre of 1770 uh, was a major event. Uh, it, 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 you see blood shed uh, on the ground. Uh, so, and on top of that, it's a great propaganda victory for people like Paul Revere. 
Uh, there is a picture, and it's in, in some of the textbooks. I don't remember if it's in yours or not, but there's a picture uh, that shows the Boston Massacre occurring in daylight and the British soldiers smiling uh, and then shooting down good men, uh, women, and children, kind of peaceable, which, of course, wasn't exactly what happened. But on and on we can go. You're going to have uh, various and sundry agitations, uh, problems in 1772, 73, 74. You're going to have the Tea Act, which precipitates the Boston Tea Party. You're going to have uh, the Boston Port Act, which will shut down the, uh, the Port of Boston after the Tea Party, which destroyed a whole lot of, uh, of embargoed or rather uh, uh, required tea. And in fact, actually, so you have a, a long string of political events, taxes issues, and rebellious acts that are going on in the Boston, New England area uh, that are going to affect the uh, coming of the American Revolution. You get a quartering act, uh, you'll get the intolerable acts, and, then, uh, and you can look through your textbook and pick them out. Uh, you probably ought to uh, for your exam. Uh, but in addition to that, you're also going to see, too, and this is a theme I raise uh, probably more so than most of my colleagues up here at Blinn, but the issue of uh, a religious angle as well. As I brought up in class and have brought up regularly during the semester to this point, a lot of those early settlers were religious dissidents and they will teach their history to the, the descendants. They knew their history. And so I guess what you should probably make note of here is, is that in, from the 17, late 1760s all the way up basically to the beginning of the war is there's going to be about a handful of events uh, that are uh, religious in nature that in uh, in regular, normal, and less paranoid times would be, you know, they might cause grumbling but not cause panic, not cause hysteria. Uh, the Quebec Act of 17, uh, what, 1772, I believe it was, the Quebec Act basically gave, uh, was uh, designed to give political rights and tolerance rights to uh, French Catholics. But in the supercharged atmospheres of uh, early 1770s America, there were a lot of Americans who said, oh my gosh, there's going to be a Catholic army marching on the Americas. And then on top of that, you're going to have uh, some uh, an Anglican priest, a preacher, rector down in uh, Virginia call for more Anglican bishops brought to America. And a lot of Presbyterians, their hair stood on the back of their head because they being Scottish Presbyterians or English Presbyterians, they knew what happened when Lordly Bishop showed up. They took over, they started uh, requisitioning your land, they acted in a lordly manner, and they took away your rights, uh, your inalienable rights, whether they're in this case religious or property or all the above. So there was uh, complaints and worries about that. And then, too, in uh, may have been 1774, you got again, check me on the dates. It's in your textbook. I put it on the review sheet, and I'm doing this uh, without a uh, master list right in front of me. But there was also a, a Toleration Act. I call it in your notes the Religious Toleration Act. Uh, but a Toleration Act that was designed to offer toleration uh, as formally a religious toleration, and it went down to defeat in the Parliament in London. And that gave a lot of Americans pause, and they said, oh my gosh, it is true. There is a tyranny coming, and it's not just in the form of removal of property and taxes and such, but it's also in the reimposition of a religious tyranny that is going to destroy our Presbyterianism, going to destroy our Quakerism, going to destroy our uh, Congregationalism. Oh my, what is going on? The country is, the, 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 our liberty is dearly at stake. What shall we do? And, of course, the answer Locke and other Whigs would say is take up arms to defense, uh, question authority, basically uh, rebel, rebel. Now, how far you push rebellion is a little bit of an, is the angle and the issue here. But a lot of Americans are looking around. They are seeing in the tea leaves, they're saying, oh, my tyranny is afoot. We must do something. So if you came to this course thinking it was just about taxes and people rose up just about taxes, that misses, uh, misses it. That's like looking at the little tip of the iceberg and down below the water level, there's so much more. Religious uh, antipathy, uh, habits of self-governance, we do it our way, leave us alone. It's one, in fact, actually, I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a fella, he was uh, about 1840 or so, 1845 when he was interviewed. It was, uh, uh, it was late, late, late. He was one of the last survivors of uh, Lexington and Concord. And one of the interviewers uh, said to him, uh, Sir, uh, were y'all quoting Locke when you went into battle? When are you quoting Locke uh, 
when y'all went to fight the, the Redcoats? And he said, no, we did not. We didn't know Locke. I've never heard of the guy. He said, I know this, though. We fought the Redcoats because they may, they came and they aimed to make us uh, heal, make us come, uh, not heal like in H-E-A-L, uh, but heal like H-E-E-L, I guess, uh, we, uh, kneel to the British. And we weren't going to have that. We were Americans, and we do it our way. I'm obviously paraphrasing using our language, uh, but we'd have none of that. And so there's uh, religious uh, uh, issues. There are uh, Whig issues with regard to tyranny and taxation, habits of self-governance. They all come to that confluence together. Americans were stockpiling firearms. And these the Americans were stockpiling firearms coming into 1774 and 75 with worries that perhaps they might have to use them. While at the same time American colonials are stockpiling firearms and creating committees of correspondence and committees of safety and uh, these various militia groups, uh, the fact of the matter is in 1774 and especially again in 1775 you're going to see the creation and the coming together of the colonies into one general assembly you can call in your notes the Continental Congress. Now the Continental Congress is the first uh, successful attempt, especially the Second Continental Congress, is the first successful attempt by the uh, colonials to break, come together as some sort of functioning uh, unity, some sort of functioning whole. You'd have uh, fits and starts before the First Continental Congress was, uh, I, you know, I wouldn't say it's a failure, but it's not well, it's not completely attended. Uh, the Albany Plan of Union didn't go so well, and, then, and on from there. Uh, but the Second Continental Congress is really going to be, in a sense, the voice of the colonies. Maybe not the people, but the voice of the colonies, and it will act as the voice of the colonies uh, in many respects through the out, throughout the war. The Continental Congress is going to have in it some of the most prominent names in American history. Names such as Thomas Jefferson, names such as Benjamin Franklin, who had been run out of England because of his sympathies for the uh, mother, or for his motherland, which is the, the American colonies. Uh, you're going to have at, the Adamses are there, John uh, Witherspoon, uh, John Winthrop, Excuse me, not John Winthrop, John Witherspoon. Uh, you're going to also have, uh, 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 what's his name, George, John Hancock, of course, uh, and you could go on from there. The point is, is there's a very prominent set of names that are going to make their way into this Continental Congress. George Washington, of course, would be one of the most prominent names, physically one of the most prominent examples. So uh, the long and the short of it is, is that this Continental Congress is going to meet, and they're going to start to uh, laying out grievances. They're going to start to making petitions to the Crown, uh, very much acting in a, frankly, illegal manner. Uh, this is an American tradition. This is an English tradition in a sense, but the English crown is uh, and the English government in 1775 is starting to harden its stance and send more and more troops to uh, to the uh, to the countryside. But the fact of the matter is, is that when you talk about the coming of the American Revolution, uh, they really the first shots of the revolution that take place on the uh, Greens at Lexington and Concord and uh, get a bunch of British soldiers killed in April of 1775, that is the point of no return. That is the time in which uh, the point uh, that uh, the war is on uh, to one degree or another. Will it be a full-fledged revolution? Will it be a limited revolution? Hard to tell in April of 1775. But the British had become aware of the stockpile of, Brit of American arms and supplies, and no faster way to pacify a people than to take away their guns. And so the British sent out soldiers, hundreds of soldiers, on a nighttime march to go to Lexington and Concord and to remove the weaponry uh, from those arsenals, from those armories at those towns. Some of you are very familiar with the story of Paul Revere and his friends and in the midnight ride, the British are coming, the British are coming, the British are coming out of Boston. And that's true. It's not that long of a march. It's only about a 13, 15 mile march and back again. If it was done as it was originally planned, it probably would have worked. You'd have gotten the guns. The British are not looking to start a fight. If a fight comes, they'll fight. But they're not looking to provoke the uh, Americans into a battle. They're looking to get their guns before the American militia wake up and know what hit them. But the uh, British were slow. Uh, they started marching a little bit late. 
uh, they were uh, the American militia were warned and ready and on the battlefields at Lexington and Concord shots rang out men are going to fall it's going to turn into a fiasco for the British they don't uh, collect the weapons that they thought and as more and more shots ring out in Lexington and Concord uh, more and more militia from Connecticut and, and Rhode Island and Massachusetts and New Hampshire uh, and from the countryside of Massachusetts come streaming in it's almost like blood rushing to the stomach uh, to help digest some food uh, but these these militiamen are streaming into the roads there in and around Concord and Lexington and the British have to march back through some very heavily wooded forests and militia especially militia that is filled with uh, spirit and fury uh, and really hadn't tasted bullets whizzing back at them just yet these militiamen make great great snipers uh, hunt and snipe sort of thing and so they hit and run hit and run before it's all said and done hundreds of British soldiers lay dead or wounded on their road back to Lexington and Concord blood has been spilled and it's not a little bit of blood either it's not just one person here or one soldier wounded there this is true bloodshed this is a true shooting and it is the point of no return it is the Rubicon of the American Revolution once you do that and once you shed that sort of blood you can't go back and now for the Continental Congress in 1775 the issue becomes what do we do now what do we do now we've got to raise an army and in fact, arguably, you've already got an army starting to form at Boston because there were a lot of militiamen who just simply chased the British back into Boston and started to make up impromptu camps around Boston. One of the things that was fearful not only to the British or to the, Eng to the English British or to the uh, Russians or a German or uh, frankly anyone in Europe of that time period, but also fearful for the American leadership, such as an Adams or a Franklin or a Washington, was is that you have this armed and unruly mob, and you don't know where mobs go, because mobs are are like the the giant uh, monster without a head. They they kind of lurch from this to that, and if you ever get caught up in their gears, it is not exactly pretty. So, anyways, long and the short of it is, is that we've got to put together an army and try to give it some sort of semblance of control and op and uh, and not only just control but just discipline and and simply order. And the man who's going to be tabbed for that, of course, is George Washington. To read Washington's correspondence from that time period, you'd think the man had not wanted the job, but George Washington regularly, if not every day, wore his militia outfit, his militia uniform, his Virginia uniform to the Continental Congress every day and with that six foot one maybe six foot two inch frame on a good day walking into the room all strapping and very imposing of a figure his reputation preceded him he's one of the wealthiest men in America let alone the stuff with the French and Indian War when Washington walks into that room with a bunch of others like an Adams and Franklin and so forth who really never wore uh, a military man's uniform uh, Washington stood out the fact that Washington comes from Virginia, the most populous state, is also a good thing. And also, it basically means that Washington, uh, through his own negotiation and through his own advertising, Washington will be your first commander-in-chief of the Continental Forces. So, uh, the Continental Army, I should call it, per, per, more productively. But the fact of the matter is, is that is uh, a good place to stop for this uh this time period. Uh, you have a good day. Thank you for watching and uh, we'll see you soon.